O give thanks to the Lord, says the psalmist, for God is good. His steadfast love endures forever. You are my God, and I will give thanks to you. You are my God, and I will extol your name. O give thanks to the Lord, for He is good. His steadfast love endures forever. Let me invite everyone to please stand at this time for our invocation and remain standing for our opening hymn of praise. Mr. Frank Moore, would you come and lead us as we pray, please? May we pray. Father, we thank you for the opportunity that you've given us to be in your house this morning. We thank you, Father, for all the many blessings that you bestow upon us. As we worship you this morning, Father, we pray that the hymns that are sung the words that are spoken, and the prayers that are prayed will be to praise your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Good morning. Please take your hymnals and turn to hymn number 640 and join in singing, Let All Things Now Living. today uh, in this Thanksgiving season. Uh, we are thankful that we have an opportunity to gather this morning and to worship together. If you're visiting with us, especially for the first time, we do welcome you today. Uh, we have some information we would love to share with you concerning our congregation. As you exit today, you may see one of our ushers and they can give you one of our information bags. Also want to welcome everyone joining us by Facebook Live this morning. Uh, that is a part of our ministry that we have been engaged in over the last several months. Uh, many of you have taken advantage of the video, uh, which is recorded throughout the week. 
Uh, but it is wonderful that those who are not able to be with us on Sunday morning can feel they are a part of all that goes on, and so we welcome them this day as well. Please take a moment to look at the opportunities for the week. Just a couple of things to highlight. Uh, those of you on our budget committee uh, will be meeting tomorrow night at 7 o'clock. Our Young at Heart will be going out to lunch at Golden Corral on Tuesday. If you would like to carpool, please be at the church at 11. And then also Tuesday night, our Four Oaks Chamber of Commerce is sponsoring the Four Oaks Vision and Economic Positioning Forum. Uh, that is open to everyone who is interested in hearing about and having a say in what all is going on in Four Oaks as we move forward, uh, especially with our uh, businesses and our local community. That is here at our church in the Fellowship Hall, again, at 6 o'clock on Tuesday night. Also this morning, we do want to thank all of you who came Wednesday night uh, who helped pack shoe boxes. We had a great, great evening. We were able to pack 169 shoe boxes for Operation Christmas Child. We still have a few boxes uh, that we're trying to pack to reach that goal of 200. Some of you may have taken a box and packed that as an individual or a family. Please bring those this week and we'll be transporting them to our local collection site at Beulah Hill. Uh, but we would like to include those as part of our number. So if you have those, uh, please bring those this week. If you would like to pick up a box and pack, there are still a few left in the fellowship hall. Or if you would like to make a donation to help pack those boxes or to purchase the postage to send those boxes, you may simply make out a check to the church, but in the memo line put donation for Operation Christmas Child. Again, thank all of you for coming out and for the items you've brought throughout the year, uh, for the monies that you've given to make this possible, and again, for all of those who came on Wednesday night uh, to help us to pack. Also this morning, we do want to put in a few reminders. Next Sunday, immediately after worship, uh, it is time to transform our sanctuary and our church uh, from Thanksgiving decorations to Christmas decorations, believe it or not. So next Sunday, immediately after worship, we're going to have a soup and sandwich luncheon, and then we'll spend some time decorating the interior of our church. Uh, if you can help bring items for soup and sandwich, uh, drinks, desserts, uh, we're going to have an online sign-up that we'll be sending out tomorrow uh, via email. But if you would like to go ahead and put your name down for bringing one of those items, please see Jamie Champagne today uh, before you leave. And then we'll be sending out that sign-up sheet tomorrow. Then on December the 1st, two weeks from today, December the 1st, the first Sunday of Advent, We'll have, be having a Chris Mon service in our sanctuary during our 11 o'clock worship hour. Uh, this is where we take the Chris Mons and we tell the story behind each one and the significance and symbolism which each Chris Mon has. Uh, and then we'll continue decorating and finish decorating our tree. Uh, we do invite our children to participate in this. Uh, Lauren Strickland, who is the chair of our children's committee, is helping us to coordinate that. So if your child is interested in helping with carrying a Christmas on that day, please let Lauren Strickland know. And then also, uh, we are in the midst of a brick paver campaign. Uh, we have information concerning that in the foyer this morning. There's a sample of uh, a brick uh, that shows what we're looking at doing and then also sign up forms for that. Uh, so please take those today and uh, consider that over the next few weeks. Bill? Just a note, too, on the Chrismon service. If, if your child has been coming on Wednesday night and practicing with the children's choir, uh, they will be singing a song in this service on that Sunday morning. They'll be singing Away in the Manger. So just wanted to let you know that. Uh, they only have this one Wednesday night practice coming up, and then, you know, we don't have Wednesday night services before Thanksgiving. So if you would please try and have them here this Wednesday night, that would be great. And I'm sure Je Summer and Jesse will get some more information to the parents, too. Thank you. Thank you very much, Phyllis. It is good to be in this place today as we have come to worship and as we are mindful of being thankful. Won't you stand and welcome one another this morning? Yeah. 
gotta be hard. It's hard to do everything. <laughs> it's hard to do everything. Yeah. Sanity is kind of needed. Yes. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Jesse, is it too late for Amelia to come? No, uh, we're taking a way to major. We're just doing the first three or all three okay. verses of the way to major. Okay. All right. We chose a song because she cause it's decided it real late so that the kids could learn. Music. Okay, so she can still get okay. <laughs> Boys and girls, that was lame. Good morning, thank you, Amelia. Okay, so what are some things that you guys get like super excited about? I mean, like you just can't even control your excitement, or something that just makes you feel so joyful that just like you can't control it. What are some things that make you that happy? Thanksgiving, Thanksgiving, food, yeah, me too. Christmas, Christmas, yeah, I thought about that too. Christmas. Okay, so how do you show that excitement? I like what are things that you do? Some people get, like, sometimes, like, if I get really excited, like, I'll cry. Like, I'm a crier, so I cry, even if I'm mad, sad, whatever. Uh, ha like, what does your happy look like? The, do that again. Your, whole, your whole body just shook. <laughs> Running in circles, screaming. Like there's a, well, that's not something to be joyful about. But like you would kind of just run around and be crazy and happy. Yeah. Yeah. So what are some other ways that you guys would show excitement? Does anybody sing when they get excited or they're super, super duper joyful? I'm not a very good singer or a dancer, so I don't really like dance. I might kind of like wiggle. I wiggle a lot. Yeah. If I get like a snack or like a dessert that I really like, I'll stand at the counter and I kind of like wiggle like this. <laughs> I really do. <laughs> sometimes, sometimes. Okay, so I have a piece of scripture I would like to read. And it says, the Lord your God is in your midst, a mighty one who will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you with his love. He will exalt you, exalt over you with loud singing. So the first part says that he's in our midst. What does that mean? He's among us. He's with us always, right? He'll never leave us behind. Yes. And so who is the, it says, a mighty one who will save. Who is that mighty one that saves? Yes. Yes, he, he is. Yes, you are exactly right. So what does he save us from? From protection. What does he protect us from? Bad guys like what? Sin? The devil. Yes, that is what he does. And strangers. And no, we shouldn't talk to strangers. You should ask your parents first. Get parents' permission. Okay, so then the next part says he rejoices over us. So that means he gets excited about us. He gets excited about you. He gets excited about me. Like that. That's how he feels sometimes. I think that that's what he thinks about. And his love gives us peace. Maybe we're a little upset about something and we don't have peace in our hearts. So his love does that for us. Yes, maybe, our, maybe your heart feels like the Grinch. And God gives us two sizes too big. Yeah. Okay, now the last part says he exalts over us with loud singing. Does anybody know what exalts means? E-X-U-L-T-S. Does anybody, you guys don't know what that means? Yeah, okay. So I'll read the definition, okay, because I had to look it up because I was thinking exalt, but that's not, that's not what it says. Exalt is with an A, and this is with a U. 
So it says it means to express your joy in some visible way. So how did you show your joy? You ran around screaming like crazy. That's how you exalt yourself when you, whenever for Christmas and your birthday. What? You got a lot of candy. Were you so happy? Did you exult? Did you run around crazy? No, you didn't act crazy. Okay. Um, so you didn't run around crazy. Let me finish reading what this word means because it's like super, like I thought this was a really good word. Some people exult in a sedate manner, maybe just enjoying their happiness quietly within themselves. So maybe you can't really see it in other people. Maybe they're just super duper quiet. Some people have quiet personalities. I'm looking at some of you and some of you guys are pretty quiet. Um, and it says others are more emotional. Like I said, when I get really excited or something really, really just overjoys me, like I'll start crying. Um, and it says perhaps expressing their triumph in a loud or physical manner, Amelia, and when you break the word down into Latin parts, like when you, you guys talk about root words at school and stuff like that, it says that um, it says to leap. So exult means to leap with joy. So I kind of brought up some pictures and I couldn't really find any good ones. Um, see that guy jumping? So He's like jumping like that. He's leaping for joy. That's how God feels about us. That's what that verse says is that he gets excited over us. Do, you, do your parents ever watch like sports games or anything like that? Do they yell and scream at the TV? No? At our house, yeah, at our house when we're watching college football, like if something, well, we yell when bad stuff happens too. But when our team does something really good, we're like, yeah, you need like everybody comes out of their rooms and they're like, what just happened? So that's like the that's kind of what i think that like whenever people turn their faith to jesus and they decide to accept jesus as their savior sometimes i feel like that's what they do in heaven that's what i think that god does they're like yes you know and they're like jumping around and running around in circles and like super excited yes that's what i think and that's what you know that's how god feels about us that's pretty awesome that god feels like that excited about you individually that's pretty awesome right yeah, I think so too. Okay, so let us pray. Does anybody want to pray? No. No? No? All right. Uh, if you want to pray, you could pray. You sure? Okay. Last chance. All right, let us pray. Lord, we thank you for your love, that it is just that you rejoice over us, you exult over us, and that is just so unbelievable that a creator of everybody that you know our hearts and that even though we make mistakes sometimes that you still love us that much anyway and Lord I just pray that these children feel that kind of love and know that you love them in that way and that Lord that we return that same love back to you and exalt you because you sent a savior for us even though we do mess up and we're just so thankful for that that we want to rejoice and leap for joy in Jesus name amen If I had one-tenth of that energy, I would be good. <laughs> as we pray today, we do want to mention a few names. Please remember Jack Van as he's continuing to go through rehab at Springbrook. Also, Carl Langdon fell a few weeks ago, um, suffered from a compression fracture in his back. He is also at Springbrook in Clayton, so please remember Carl and Nancy. Also, Cindy Summerall's mom is at the hospice house in Smithfield. Please lift up Mrs. Barrett in your prayers. Uh, Valerie Howell's brother passed away this past week, so we remember that family in our prayers. Uh, and we just found out before worship today that Jackie Parrish fell uh, in the night and is at the hospital in Smithfield. Uh, so please remember Jackie in your prayers uh, as we lift up all of these names. 
And as we remember those that are, are on your hearts and your minds, would you please bow with me this morning and let us pray together the prayer that our Lord has taught us. Let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. The offertory hymn this morning is hymn number 643. Please turn in your hymnals and stand as we sing. God, we've just sung in the help we give our neighbors in the worldwide task of caring for the hungry and despairing, in the harvest we are sharing, God's will is done. Father God, we do give thanks for this time of thanksgiving, this season when we focus on others and the needs, the needs in our community. And we just give thanks for the bounty you've given us. And as we come to your altar with these tithes and offerings, we just ask your guidance that they might be used to serve you. For we pray in thy holy name. Amen.
morning we wander back to the Old Testament and the Old Testament book of <laughs> Zephaniah. We'll be reading overall chapter 3, verses 14 through 20. If you would like to turn in your Bibles, I invite you to do so, either in a printed Bible, a digital version, or if you would like to use our Pew Bibles, you'll find this text on page 767. Many times the prophets, especially of the Old Testament, have a bad rap. For most often we associate them with simply doom and gloom. Now, in reality, the message of the prophets does have that element that goes along with their message. Judgment is coming, thus says the Lord. But in the prophets, there's also a sense of hope, a sense of tomorrow, a sense of what could change, a sense of what could be better, a sense of what must be or might be transformed. Hear these words. In verse 9 of chapter 3. At that time I will change the speech of the peoples to a pure speech, says the Lord, that all of them may call on the name of the Lord and serve Him with one accord. From beyond the rivers of Ethiopia, my suppliants, my scattered ones, shall bring my offering. And in these words of hope. Sing aloud, O daughter Zion, shout, O Israel, rejoice and exult with all your heart, O daughter Jerusalem. For the Lord has taken away the judgments against you. He has turned away your enemies. The King of Israel, the Lord, is in your midst. You shall fear disaster no more. On that day it shall be said to Jerusalem, Do not fear, O Zion. Do not let your hands grow weak. For the Lord your God is in your midst, a warrior who gives victory. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will renew you in His love. He will exult over you with loud singing as on a day of festival. I will remove disaster from you so that you will not bear reproach for it. I will deal with all your oppressors at that time and I will save the lame and gather the outcast and I will change their shame into praise and renown in all the earth. At that time I will bring you home, at the time when I gather you. For I will make you renowned and praised among all the peoples of the earth, when I restore your fortunes beyond your eyes. Thus says the Lord.
you very much, choir. So Zephaniah is one of those Old Testament books that on the norm we would not visit very much. It's really not included in the yearly reading of the lectionary. It's really not looked to very much, even in the times of Advent, uh, like we'll be looking at some of the other prophets in just a few weeks. Zephaniah, in many ways, gets overlooked as an Old Testament book. And yet, its place in the Old Testament canon of Scripture, its, its place in the life of the Hebrew people, and its message to us today as believers, I believe, is still very relevant. The book of Zephaniah and the prophet Zephaniah probably can be placed in the history of the southern kingdom of Judah towards the end of King Josiah's reign. Now, if you look back on the kings of the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah, Josiah could be said to be one of those good kings. Although not in the same uh, category, not cut from the same cloth, if you will, as King David, still King Josiah seemed to try to bring the attention of the people of Judah back to the focus upon God. Josiah began a restoration project in the temple. Josiah encouraged the religious leaders to, to get back to the law of God in the, that book that they had discovered as they did those renovations in the temple to dedicate themselves once again to God. But as in many things, Josiah's reforms were a, too little too late for the sin of Judah and its people was so pervasive, it was so overwhelming that even with the reforms of the good king, it seemed Judah was well on its way to destruction. You see, Judah had fallen under the same seduction as its northern kingdom kin, in the sense that they had turned to their direction, they had turned their gaze upon other gods, and that they were worshiping other gods. Now, again, even with the reforms of Josiah, they were worshiping Yahweh, the true God of Israel, but to hedge their bets, they were worshiping the other gods, the gods of the Ammonites, the gods of the Canaanites, like the Baals. And before we look on them and say, well, that was in another time and in another place, and those people were overtly worshiping other gods, I think we always need to ask ourselves in our lives, even in the 21st century, even though we might say there is one God, one God above the whole universe, are there still things in our lives that we turn our lives over to? Are there things in our lives that we worship other than God, the true God? All we have to stop and do is think, what are we making sacrifices for? What do we write checks for? Where do we spend our time and our energy and our effort? On what altars of this world do we lay our children? What do we turn our hearts and our minds, and our very souls off over to? Is it truly the God that we worship, or that we say we worship? Or is it all the other things that crowd out God in our lives? That pervasive aspect of chasing other gods had even invaded the religious leaders of the day. And God has his say with that. In the beginning verses of chapter 3, the prophet tells us that God says, Ah, soiled and defied oppressing city. It has listened to no voice. It has accepted no correction. It is not trusted in the Lord. It is not drawn near to its God. And then these words, The officials within it are roaring lions. Its judges are evening wolves that leave nothing until the morning. Its prophets are reckless, faithless persons. Its priests have profaned what is sacred. They've done violence to the law. 
Now this is in the early 600s B.C., but in many ways you could apply those words to the 21st century and political and religious leaders in our own day. Anytime individuals turn their gaze off of God and they chase after the gods of this world, whether it be money or fame or fortune or whatever it might be, these words of the prophet Zephaniah apply. And they apply in our lives as well. Now, as I said, the prophets are most often known for their doom and their gloom message. And most definitely Zephaniah includes that. For Zephaniah tells the people of Judah that a day is coming when judgment will be poured out upon them. Zephaniah talks about this day as the day of the Lord. That phrase is referred to over and over and over again in the book of Zephaniah. The day of the Lord for Zephaniah was, was a day that in reality was a present experience. For Zephaniah, through God's vision and God's words to him, saw that Judah would be overthrown, that the people of Judah would be judged. And not only them, but the nations around them. As the book of Zephaniah unfolds, we realize that God's judgment isn't just pointed at the people of Judah. It's pointed also upon those that seduced the people of Judah to chase their gods, to listen to them, and to be pulled away from the true God. Judgment is about to take place. And Zephaniah says it's going to happen. Indeed, judgment would come as the people of Judah in 586, 587 B.C. are carted off to exile in Babylon. And there, they would suffer the consequences of their actions, their behaviors, and their loves that had gone astray. But Zephaniah also understands that judgment is a future concept as well. Zephaniah knew, just like we know, that when people walk away from God and judgment comes as in the day of the people of Israel, and they decide to turn back to God, the history of the people of Israel tells Zephaniah that this is a recurring story over and over and over again. For God's judgment comes, the people cry out to God, God delivers them, and then they turn away from God, and then judgment. Then they cry out to God, God delivers them, they turn away from God, and then judgment. That scenario gets played out over and over in the people's lives in Israel. And we know all too well that our world, when we think it's doing great, when we think it's doing well, when we think it's doing wonderful, suddenly the bottom falls out. We wonder, we grapple, we try to put pieces together. And then maybe there's an upswing, and then suddenly there's a fall. This cycle seems to be going over and over and over. And so for Zephaniah, the judgment of God, the day of the Lord, was not only a present reality for the people of Judah, but Zephaniah seems to be pointing to a time in the future when evil itself will be judged. Not just those who succumb to evil, but evil itself will be overcome and will be dethroned and will be done away with. Many of you this morning in your Sunday school class studied the portion of Scripture from Matthew that talks about the sheep and the goats and the dividing of the sheep and the goats as the king comes to bring history as we know it to a close. There is that in the future that still has not come yet, that concept of judgment. But in reality, it seems that judgment in Scripture, both Old Testament and New Testament, is of a little different variety as well. For God often in the lives of the Israelites... And even in the lives of the people that we know as the first and second century church, it seems that God's act of judgment is just simply giving the people over to what they want. 
In the first few chapters of Romans, that's exactly what Paul says judgment is, is that God just simply says, well, do it the way you want to. Have it the way you want it. Follow your own direction. And we all know what happens when we do that. That this giving over is God's judgment. When we say we want our way, when we say we want to do it ourselves, when we say, God, it's fine, we appreciate your suggestions, but we've got this. And we put God on the back burner. More often than not, in the Old Testament, in the New, it's this concept of God just simply giving over to us and letting us achieve our desires. But there's a second aspect to the book of Zephaniah. Zephaniah talks about judgment and its reality, both present and future, but he also uses another word in his text. It's the word of remnant. A remnant. Now, some of you may not know what that word is. It's kind of an old-timey word, but most often than not, it's associated with sowing. Maybe you have a remnant of cloth that you've sewed uh, or that has been discarded and you pull that remnant out and you attach it to something else. Uh, it's something that's been cut from a larger piece, but you hang on to it and you keep it because you might be able to repurpose it again someday. And so that remnant you bring out and you attach to something larger and make it beautiful. Once again, it's a remnant. God says, I'm going to have a remnant of the people that no matter how bad it gets and no matter how many people turn away from me and no matter how bad judgment is going to be, that there will always be a remnant of individuals who turn their hearts to me. That God will not be left voiceless in the midst of the people. And it's interesting to see that for the prophet Zephaniah, the message of doom and gloom and God's judgment, the concept of remnant begins to turn a corner as an aspect of the reality of hope. And hope ultimately becomes what the last chapter of the book of Zephaniah is about, the last verses in verses 9 through 20. It is a concept of hope. And I hope as you read the book of Zephaniah and as you comprehend the book of Zephaniah and as you understand the reality that sin and our ways of searching after other gods will be judged, that there is hope for us as there was hope for the people of Judah. I love in verse 17 of chapter 3, Zephaniah says, The Lord your God is in your midst. That phrase gets repeated a couple of different times. The Lord your God is in your midst. It's a promise that God's presence is going to be among the people, that God Himself is going to be in the middle of them. And I can't think of a better desire, a, a better blessing, when we think about the blessings of God, than to have God's presence in our midst. Interesting to note when you get to the Gospel of John, John chapter 3 verse 14 says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, lived among us, pitched His tent among us, walked among us, was in our midst. But then in chapter 3 verse 20, there's another concept that I think was very important to the people of Judah. At that time, God says, I will bring you home. At that time, I will gather you. Now, on the ears of individuals in Judah who were in Jerusalem, they were home. These words of hope might not have sounded right. But again, couple that with the concept that they are going to be judged. They will be removed from their home. They will be in exile in Babylon. These words of the prophet to the people 
from God, I will bring you home. I will deliver you. I will save you. I will redeem you. I will restore to you your home. For somebody that is far away from home, that promise becomes very real. Again, I turn to the Gospel of John in chapter 14. Jesus is preparing his disciples for his going away, for his suffering the cross. And he gives them hope by saying, Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. For in my Father's mansion, in my Father's house, in my Father's home, there are many dwelling places. It's interesting when you read the New Testament how especially in the person of Jesus Christ, in his ministry, in his preaching and teaching and healing, and even in his death upon the cross, we see a glimpse in the Old Testament kind of pointing us toward this reality, kind of directing our gaze into the future, that even though the writers of the Old Testament could not see it in, in fullness, could not comprehend it, yet they still were obedient to God in recording what they heard from the Word of God. And now as we read it, we look back and we say, how, how beautiful, how wonderful that in Jesus Christ, we not only understand that God is in our midst, but in Jesus Christ, we are called home. That's why for today's world, even though the words of Zephaniah and the Gospel of John seem so far away from us, they still have a reality in the 21st century. For how many of us long to have God's presence in our lives? How many of us want to feel like we are at home? How many of us feel like we have been pushed far away, that we are in exile? How many of us need to be restored and renewed and refreshed by the presence of the living God? Brothers and sisters, the realities that Zephaniah talked about that existed for the people of Judah in the early 600s B.C., the realities that Jesus of Nazareth spoke of in the first century A.D. are still realities that human beings deal with today. We all turn away from God. We chase after the gods that we've built, we've developed, we've created. We all feel a sense of not being where we should be, of being afar off, away from the home where we would love to reside. There's a stirring in our souls that we feel like something in the world is amiss. Something in the world is wrong. And it's not just in the world outside of us. It's in the world that is in us. The prophet Zephaniah pointed to the person of Jesus Christ as the fulfillment of the promises of God. This morning we look back on the person of Jesus as God's personal revelation to the world. God in the flesh. God come to us making good on the promises that were made. For in Him we find that He is in our midst and that we are at home. Now, one of the beautiful images that the New Testament gives us from the Gospels and from the writings of Paul and the other writers of the New Testament, including the book of Revelation, is this. 
that in many ways what the prophets and what even Jesus himself spoke of in the fulfillment of the world in some point in the future, that reality is given to us in the context of the people of faith today. The body of believers that we are are continued to be the remnant that God holds out for the salvation of the world as we take to our task the promise and the commission that God has given us that in the person of Jesus Christ, in His life and His death and His resurrection, that God is setting the world to rights. That through Him, He redeems individuals and sets them right with God. But that also as King, as Lord, as Savior, He sets the world to rights as God intended, the way God wants it. And that is the message we take to the world. And when we gather, and when other believers gather together, that becomes what I refer to as a foretaste of glory divine. That we've not yet seen that fulfillment complete, but yet we've got a taste of it. We can see it. We can feel it. The promises that God has promised us to complete one day, we know has already broken out in our midst because Jesus Christ has come and lived among us and given us hope and taken our sins upon Himself. And if we confess and follow Him, we're already stepped into that glory divine. Life here is still yet perfect. It's not perfect. And yet we're proclaiming a reality that is breaking itself into our midst. Brothers and sisters, when we gather in the name of Jesus Christ, we are tasting that glory divine. As the writer of Revelation reminds us, those who gather around the throne and bring God's praises, what do we do on Sunday mornings? But bring God praise. I guess I say all this to finally say that God really is working in the world. That no matter how we or others try to say that God, if there is a God, exists somewhere out in the universe apart from us, separated from us, and really doesn't care what goes on here, we can be reminded and we should be assured that God is at work in the world through the power of His Holy Spirit and that what we experience here on Sunday morning or any time believers gather is a foretaste of glory divine. God has poured out His Spirit upon us. God has filled us with His Holy Spirit. God is in our midst. God is our home. Would you please bow with me as we pray? Most gracious God, we thank you for speaking to us through the prophets who call our attention away from the gods of the world that we create and remind us that you are our God and that through your Son, Jesus Christ, you have already done in the midst of history what you promised to do at the end of history, that in and through your Son, Jesus Christ, we have a foretaste of glory divine. Lord, as we follow Him, as we turn our lives over to Him, as we sacrifice ourselves to Him, fill us with your Holy Spirit and help us to be at home. For it's in your Son's name we pray. Amen. Our hymn of invitation this morning is hymn number 294. As we think about our lives, as we think about the life of God, may we truly tell the Lord, have your own way, as we stand and as we sing.
Mass Congregation be seated for just a moment. Riley, come on up here and join me. This morning, Riley Ruth Rayner comes to share uh, some information with us that we wanted to share with the congregation. Uh, Riley uh, came up a couple of weeks ago and talked to me and Jamie after our homecoming service. And you all may remember that service. It was a very meaningful and moving service for all of us, I think, and very much so for Riley. Uh, most of you know, some of you may not know, that uh, as we dedicated the sign that day to, in uh, memory of Miss Dorothy Parker, uh, Riley read scripture for us that day. Riley is uh, Miss Dorothy's great-granddaughter. And so it was just a very moving service for everybody. Riley shared with us at that time um, that she's already a Christian. She's already professed, professed faith in Christ. Um, but she felt in that service that she, in her words, needed to do something. And so she comes this morning um, making that public to us and desiring baptism. So based on that decision and that request, what is the pleasure of this congregation? I have a motion to accept her. Uh, second, do I have a second? second? Have a second, wonderful. All in favor, please say amen. 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 Riley, welcome. Uh, we know you and you know us, and we thank you for coming this morning. And what you've heard from this group is that uh, as you continue your journey in faith and walking with the Lord, that these people are going to support you, they're going to encourage you, they're going to pray for you, they're going to do whatever they can to help you in that life of faith. And the only thing they ask in return is that you do the same for them. Pray for them, encourage them in their lives of faith. Um, because as the Apostle Paul reminds us, um, even though you are young, that we have to listen to you as the body of the church because your life of faith is just as important as everyone else's life of faith in the world. Okay? So you encourage us and you pray for us and you help us. Okay? Anything you want to say? Okay. Good? Yeah. Yeah. All right. Very good. Um, after our benediction, you all are going to be invited up uh, to welcome Riley and to congratulate her and to pledge your support and encouragement to her this morning. So <coughs> would you all please stand for our benediction? <coughs> yeah. Put you right here by Jane. Remember, it's by the grace of God we were brought into this world. It's by the goodness of God we've been sustained even until this very hour. And it's by the love of God most fully revealed in the face of Jesus Christ that we all are being redeemed. Upon 